You teach every child on the planet the methodology of nonviolent conflict resolution. So my thought is, I love what Archbishop Romero said when he was killed, that literally within an hour before he was killed, he said, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. That's helpful too. And the problem is we have to do everything because we're Americans. Important, <laughs> in charge. No, just do one thing and do it well with a lot of love. So wherever your heart is stirred, I heard so many people say, the prison work, environment, nuclear weapon, bang, get involved. And you're, once you've got one foot in, in the issue in the movement, you're connected to the whole of human race. It's all one. So I wanted just to say a little bit about Gandhi, a little bit about Jesus, if you can stand it. Uh, you're being very nonviolent, I wanted to. So there, are, there are a few Buddhists here who are about to convert, so get ready. So, you know, I had, if you, this is my anthology of Gandhi's writings. I read the 100 volumes, the collected works of Gandhi, and about 50 biographies, and Daniel Berrigan said I had overdosed on Gandhi and needed a 12-step group. <laughs> If you, I have a long introduction here uh, about writing the life of Gandhi. And if you don't know Gandhi, go and study it. It's talk about a lotus in a sea of fire. King said he's the greatest person in modern times. I still agree with that, the greatest teacher. And I have really beautiful 12 points in the beginning of my long essay summarizing Gandhi's vision. <laughs> and then yesterday I'm reading my own book, and Gandhi comes up with his own five points. They're better than my 12. <laughs> I'm going to read to you. These are Gandhi's five basic points. It, it, so there's a little introduction. Nonviolence to be a creed has to be all pervasive. All right, that's just ridiculous. Do you hear the word creed? Nonviolence is a creed. It's, a, what you, it's your belief. It's at the heart of it. I cannot be nonviolent about one activity of mine and violent about others. That would be a policy not a life force. That's a whole other word right there, Satyagraha, his word, because he had problems with nonviolence too, so he, he held a contest to come up with a better word than nonviolence. And he gave himself the prize. <laughs> He's very funny guy. He's just like Tutu. He must have they said he was so much fun to be with that you just dropped everything. He had 400 people living in his empire. Because he, he, was, he just laughed with them all day long, even though he was getting 100 death threats a day. Let me lay down five simple axioms of nonviolence. Number one, nonviolence implies as complete self purification as humanly possible. And he's talking about getting the British to leave India. So he's saying we have to, and of course he would say we failed at that. Because when Indian independence happened, a million Indians killed one another. Mm -hmm. It was not a creed. It was not a life force, it was a policy, it was a tactic, mm -hmm. and, and that ultimately doesn't work. It has to be, that's what we're, we have to go farther than that. Second, person for person, the strength of nonviolence is in exact proportion to the ability, not the will, of the nonviolent person to inflict violence. Huh? In other words, we're violent people, and we are going to renounce our violence and channel that into positive, nonviolent action for the good, and then we're getting somewhere. And we're not beating ourselves up because we're violent. We're on a journey out of, out of violence into nonviolence. Third, nonviolence without exception is superior to violence. Do you believe that? The power at the disposal of the nonviolent person is always, always, always greater than they would have if they were violent. This is a profound truth that very few people learn. Uh, forgive me for name dropping too, but I recently met Harry Belfonte, and he was saying, Mandela told him late one night, about 10 years ago, that he was all wrong. You know, with the ANC and the violent move to get rid of apartheid, and it's been a lifelong journey to come to the truth. Whereas Harry Belfonte learned that when he was a boy from Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I invite you to reflect where you are with these teachings. And I was telling Roshi, I decided when I was a kid, I don't understand any of this, but if this is what Gandhi and King and Dorothy Day say, it's good enough for me, then I'm going to go and try and experiment with it 
And after 35 years, I'm concluding they were right. I invite you to reflect on that too. Number four, there is no such thing as defeat in nonviolence. The end of violence is always surest defeat. Now, think on that one. Mm -hmm. Could you keep it? I don't know if I dare. <laughs> <laughs> Who believes this on the planet? There is no such thing as defeat in nonviolence. We say the means are the ends. What goes around comes around. Uh, if you use peaceful means, you will reach peaceful ends. If you use Warlike means, violent means, you will always have more further violence. Violence in response to violence always leads to further violence. War never brings peace. Nonviolence toward a nonviolent end will always work. It may not happen in our time. There will be suffering along the way. But the amount of suffering will be far less than 100 million dead from the last century of war. The net fifth point, these are all kind of parallel, uh, they build up. The ultimate end of nonviolence is total victory. If such a term could be used for nonviolence, in reality, where there is no sense of defeat, really there's no victory. And that's the Buddhist insight, you know. Yes. No defeat, no victory. But you know what he's saying. I mean, that's yeah. why they call the Buddha the victorious one, the yeah. all victorious one. Yeah. Because what actually has happened, it's been victory over fear. Yeah. Victory over fear, which is the cradle of violence. I'm, forgive me, I'm a name dropper, and I'm thinking of uh, the night uh, the war began in March 2003. Shock it all. Yeah. And Thank you. Joan Wolf Bias Wolf. was singing at the Lensec, and we stayed up real late, and I was radically depressed. I'd been speaking all over the country almost every day for two months. And a lot was happening, if you remember that, February, the greatest single day in the history of the world. 12 million people marched in every continent, 600 cities, 100 nations against war. It's never happened before. It's very hopeful. I said, oh, things are so bad. Now this woman, you could argue, is the greatest peacemaker on the planet because she's been involved in every, every major movement on the planet since 1960. I mean, from Chile to Poland, South Africa to Dr. King. And she said to me, I'm, I'm complaining to Joe Biden who was trying to teach me nonviolence if she were here, she would say, he doesn't know anything. I said, oh, this, this is so hard. She said, well, you know what Gandhi would say? Well, right there, she said, who talks about Gandhi? <laughs> full effort is full victory. Mm. It's a Buddhist teaching, that's what Roshi has been telling us. Mm. You're already there. Changed my life hearing that. Whereas we keep going. Effort. That's what Tutu was telling me the other day. A few other quotes, a few random points from Gandhi. One person who can express nonviolence in life exercises a force superior to all the forces of brutality. One person who goes totally into nonviolence is a force superior to all the forces of brutality. My optimism rests on my belief in the infinite possibilities of any individual to develop nonviolence. The more you develop it in your own being, the more infectious it becomes till it overwhelms your surroundings and by and by might oversweep the world. The lotus in a sea of fire. And uh, the, the stories of his life, he got deeper and deeper in the last two years of his life because all hell's breaking out. You, it's, it wasn't even put in the movie in 1946, before independence happened, civil war broke out. The worst place in the country was a place called Noah Kali, which is basically Bangladesh today. It was all Muslim, total illiteracy. They never heard of Gandhi, and they're using machetes, and tens of thousands of people are dying each week. Gandhi said, I'm going there. And they're like, well, you don't, you, they don't even know you, I can't do anything. I'm going to do it. I will walk 10 miles a day, arrive at a village, call a meeting, and disarm them. In six months, he totally ended all the killing involved in millions of people. They were all Muslim. Literally a lotus in a sea of fire. 
And his friends said, the world, I mean, that has never been studied, what he did. It was so great. And the reporter said to him, <laughs> he had ten, nine members from the ashram went with him. And one of our BBC reporter asked one of the women, uh, no, ask Gandhi. There's ten of you? And he said, that's nine more than I need. <laughs> it's very funny. But his point is, any one person can be a spiritually explosive force of nonviolence in the world. I could go on and on about that. I find that so powerful. Uh, maybe that's enough on Gandhi. I can keep talking about it. Yeah. Maybe I'll just say a few, maybe three teachings of Jesus on nonviolence, and maybe we can have some comments. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Gandhi said the greatest writings on nonviolence in the history of the world were the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Now, in Gandhi's practice, it's so interesting, and I didn't have time to go there. In Durban, there's a Trappist monastery that was built in 1870. Thomas Merton, you know, was a Trappist monk. The monastery is still there. He visited Gandhi in 1895. Doesn't know anything about that. Created modeled his ashram on the Trappist Monastery. Well, then he got thinking, you know, that, about nonviolence, and then he it just took it to town. Uh, his practice was one hour of silent meditation in the morning, one hour of silent meditation in the evening. And every morning at 5 a.m., they read chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita, which I think I talked about here in this room once. It's so, the Hindu teachings on nonviolence. Then he read a bit of the Quran, and then he read from the Sermon on the Mount. And then they did their silence for 50 minutes. Every morning, an hour at 5 o'clock every evening for 45 years. Now he was a busy person. But the practice was the most important thing. You remember in the movie, he was walking to the prayer when he was shot and killed. He said, these are the greatest teachings of nonviolence. I want to be a person of nonviolence, so I have to return to my handbook every day. So I invite you to go maybe and read uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, mm -hmm. as Gandhi did, to learn new angles on nonviolent living. Because I started really studying them and teaching them around the country these last 10 years. And they're pretty weird. You know, it's not what I would say. And that's the point of all the teachings. They're, they're so beyond us and to sit with the teaching. And very simple things. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the sons and daughters of God. So it begins with the Beatitudes, which is like Jesus' noble eightfold path. Why, what does it mean to be a peacemaker? That's the Christian Jesus word from 2,000 years ago about uh, peace. See, Gandhi said Jesus was the most active person of nonviolence in the history of the world. And the only people on the planet who don't know that Jesus was nonviolent are Christians. <laughs> this would be the beginning and he's saying all of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are just perfect teachings of every angle of how to live a nonviolent life it's not idealistic it's very grounded and very practical <clears throat> blessed are the peacemakers uh they shall be called the sons and daughters of the God of peace, the sons and daughters of peace. I invite you to unpack that. As, as you would, we in the world think of, it's really, we've so rejected the nonviolence of Jesus that we're, we say, blessed are the war makers. And then we become sons and daughters of the culture of war. You and I want to be peacemakers. What does that mean? Um, this leads me to a new definition of nonviolence. This Christian teaching, I'm just talking about one sentence. Nonviolence is remembering who you are. You can take that in every which way. From the Christian teaching, you are the daughter of the infinite spirit of peace, the creator of peace. And so you go forth and make peace. You are the son of the God of peace. So you go forth into a world of total war and you make peace. That's what mindfulness is about. Or you are, what does it mean to you are a, a bodhisattva? Or you are a, an awakened nonviolent warrior? Or you're just a you're human being. To be human is to be nonviolent, which means.
means to be loving and compassionate and a peacemaker. And mindfulness is helping us to remember every day who we are. We are not Americans. We're not Republicans or Democrats or even defined by our career choices or our race or our gender or our religion or any of it. Fundamentally is we're a human being, we're children, of, we're sisters and brothers of one another. If you forget this is my brother, this is my sister, then you're going to do violence. That's the mindlessness. I find that very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the next verse is, you know, the minute you start working for peace and justice, you're going to get it in the neck. Mm -hmm. Bless, blessed are those who, you know, are persecuted for the work of justice. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Gandhi defined the kingdom of heaven as nonviolence. Thich Nhat Hanh defines it as the fullness of life. And blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad. Now you're like the Buddha and Isaiah and Gandhi and Dorothy Day, the prophets of old. Rejoice. This is what was helpful to me to to, to uh, cultivating joy for being in trouble, for standing up publicly and working for peace and justice. Uh, and you get to be like all the heroes of nonviolence. Aren't you excited? <laughs> <laughs> and we really get to go forth and undergo what they went, and to really go deep, and to not respond with violence, to not retaliate with further violence, even to accept suffering in the struggle for justice without a trace of the desire for retaliation. Breaking the cycle of violence. <clears throat> uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount leads into the sixth antithesis. You have heard it said, but I say to you. The first is, you have heard it said, thou shalt not kill. I say, don't even get angry. Well, that's been totally rejected by the Christian community. And he talks about the roots of violence and the hurt you've done to others. And the commandment is, katagalite, go be reconciled. But in the fifth one, if you're still with me here for a minute, this is Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, which Gandhi read every single day for 45 years. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which was at the heart of the Judaic law, which was filled with nonviolence, but it was evolving through the wisdom period in literature to the prophets and to men to this teacher. Gandhi said, well, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth makes us all blind and toothless. Mm -hmm. And war for war makes us all dead. But I say to you, the Narvana of Jesus says, offer no violent resistance to one who does evil to you. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> question or well, question? actually. <laughs> well, let me just say a word more about that. It, it's, uh, it's so powerful, because then he gives five examples about that. And it's very, it's right there. No violent resistance to one who does violence to you. Antistaining in the Greek. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn it off to the other. When someone makes you go one mile, go two miles. This great teacher, Walter Wink, unpacked it all. And, uh, you know, Jesus is saying this in, in the most horrible outskirts of the area of the Roman Empire, where people being mowed down and killed. And he's giving them a way to resist the Roman Empire. So, if, Gabriel, I'm going to come and strike you following this teaching, what's, if you're going to see me striking Gabriel, when I go to strike him, I'm going to hit him where? On the left cheek. It's not possible to do what Jesus just said. This teaching has been totally ignored. This is the methodology of nonviolence, and Gandhi tried to apply it to the world. I just read it to you. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, you turn the other as well. He's talking to an oppressed people and giving them a way out. I'm the Roman soldier coming through and you use the back of the hand on the oppressed person who's down and I'm humiliating, you know, which is at the heart of violence, whether slavery or occupation. And Jesus is saying, you turn the other cheek and say, you have to engage me as an equal, as a human being. But that's scary, and it's risky. You don't get to kill the Roman soldier. You have to dare get over your fear and engage them. And if you do that, you will disarm the Roman soldier. 
And he goes on point by point like that. And then the, the culmination is uh, um, the, the last antithesis. Uh, you have heard it said, you will love your countrymen and hate your enemy. This is nation state language. Your nation versus those people over there declared expendable by your nation and the empire. But I say to you, agape your enemies. Active, nonviolent, sacrificial, non retaliatory love for the people being targeted by your nation state. This is the climax of the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, which got Gandhi all worked up. And when you do that, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So the next part is pray for those who persecute you. <laughs> That's the only teaching on prayer we get. Uh, and then you're really sons and daughters of the God who lets the sun rise on the good and the bad, and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. The images of nature as nonviolent. The sun and the rain. And this is the, 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 the nature of God as nonviolent most political teaching in the history of the world, I think, of that time. That's the end of nation states, it's the end of war. And it's the only place in the entire Bible where you get a one sentence description of the nature of God as nonviolent. God is nonviolent.